Hello, I am John McConnell, and I'm here to present to you Charon, uh, which is a scheduler patch to the Kubernetes platform. So I would like to start things off today with a brief introduction to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestration system. It was originally developed by Google. And for those unfamiliar with the purpose of this type of system, uh, I'll briefly explain the end goal uh, for the platform. When Dealing with large deployment systems and software which needs to service many thousands of requests, it requires a fair amount of hardware. And as a software developer, your main goal is to deploy software, is to build software which can be deployed as quickly into production as possible to meet the customer's needs. So, in order to make the deployment process easier, container orchestration systems have been developed in order to ease the amount of legwork that is required to get your software from its ready state into production. Now, as you can imagine, these types of systems have many different constraints that they're trying to optimize. For example, if you are on a team which, for example, is in charge of payment processing, or you're on a team which is in charge of cryptographic, cryptographic security, you have different security constraints than different other teams on your in your company and having the same orchestration system might not be the best goal because you might need security isolation from everything else so th what i'm getting at with this explanation is that this isn't an easy problem there are many different steps involved and that it is something which if can be developed to have a, an intuitive user experience to deploy your application can be quite powerful. So as you can see with this second slide, some of the things to take into account when you're developing uh, a system which is deploying containers, or you could think of them as Linux C groups plus CH root jails, um, security, consistency of deployment, flexibility of deployment, isolation from other different systems on the network, and then also, you know, these hosts are running on hardware in a data center that communicate using D DNS or have IPs allocated using a DHCP, and then they have containers running on the nodes itself through... Um, their own interfaces on, on the host machine. How can we um, allow communication across these services dynamically uh, through deployment? So it's a very tough problem. There's the Kubernetes architecture is quite complex. I don't think I'll have enough time to explain all of it in this presentation. And so I'm going to avoid most of it but I'm going to explain three parts of it. And there's an API server, and you could think of that as basically a server which you can throw all the things you want accomplished, all the business logic you need, the thing you interact with that has all the different APIs and references, and that will maintain, that will the API server will be able to dispatch those events and commands to the correct locations. And then there's the kubelet or kubelet which will 
actually control monitoring the infrastructure host and deploying containers on the host. And then there's the controller manager, which will take care of scheduling and maintaining replication of the jobs. So the current Kubernetes scheduler is a two-phase algorithm. And the first phase is the filter phase. And what that does is tries to eliminate, and it doesn't try to, it actually successfully does, eliminates incompatible hosts with the current thing to be done. So if the thing to be done needs uh, four gigabytes of RAM, and there's only one gigabyte of RAM available on a node, the filter phase will automatically remove that node. Or for example, if a container needs to bind to a port in order to display a web page and there's no port available on the host, the filter phase will remove it. The rank phase will take all nodes which can be uh, used to provision the job and will decide which one of these um, scores the best. So there's many different ways to do this. It isn't, this part of the algorithm isn't as in as much focus because, you know, assuming you have a cluster which is big enough, um, you should be fine either way, but some things to, to take in account, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking to explore this area of research is image affinity. So when you deploy a container, a uh, container is a ch root jail plus a Linux C group, and the C, the ch root jail needs the um, file system of that image to get downloaded onto that host. And as you can imagine, that takes a lot of network um, traffic because those could be the ch root jail could be gigabytes large. So you might want to deploy to a container which already has that image downloaded. Um, the second one is the more intuitive one, which is resource pressure, which is CPU and RAM. And then the third one uh, is a randomized scheduler, which just basically goes, give me a random node. And hopefully through uh, having some a stochastic process, I'll be able to uh, achieve in high likelihood a good result. And then uh, the imp important thing to realize is that the schedule works on a per pod and given all notes basis, right? So that's how Kubernetes, the Kubernetes schedule works without the patch. Um, and that's important to realize, we'll get back to that, right? So given a single pod and all the nodes I have available and the resources available, how do I schedule um, this pod, right? And the pod is the job. So let's, let's keep track of that. So let's first, you know, um, Kubernetes was a very foreign project to me when I got started. So, you know, what's the most intuitive path for me to get started with this? Let's perform an experiment. So first, I installed Kubernetes on a Google Compute Engine platform. I had five worker nodes, two master nodes, uh, with etcd, which is the consistency database, or the, the global state database uh, that it uses. And let's see what kind of results we can get when we deploy it without a patch to the Kubernetes scheduler. Okay, so um, one of the things I found when I was toying around with this example is that as I increase the number of jobs, I could quickly overload the system where the um, amount of time it took for the scheduler to realize that the memory was being allocated and the CPU was being allocated, it already allocated too many containers onto that system and it would greatly degrade the performance of the machine because 
now you would have all these containers running and they would always be context switching and very little work would be getting done. So when I saw this result, I immediately thought, okay, here is a great area that I can improve the performance of the Kubernetes scheduler. So uh, where exactly was the insight for this, right? Okay, so the back pressure of, you know, as you can imagine, if I go, hey, I've got a Kubernetes cluster with, you know, 10 nodes, and I'm going to schedule 10,000 pods, right? As you can imagine, you know, if you have a very fast system, a thousand nodes or, you know, even, even 10,000 nodes could be scheduled very quickly before the RAM and CPU usage of the system percolates back, you know, gets updated to the scheduler. And by that point, it's too late. You've already scheduled too many containers on the system. You're going to have to kill some of them. Um, and there's going to be a lot of context switching and it's not going to be good. So instead, let's apply a back pressure algorithm. So let's change up the way the scheduler is used. So remember before when I was talking about when we have a single pod and all the nodes on the system, what I want to do is I want a single pod, all the nodes on the system, and I want the outstanding work queue, right? So let's not ignore the jobs that still need to be scheduled because those are important, right? If those jobs haven't been scheduled yet, or even if those jobs have started, have begun to have been scheduled but haven't started and haven't allocated memory for them, it's important to keep track of that. So what I did is I developed a pressure index, which is, you know, is a very simple index with the amount of consumed resources, um, per pod divided by the outstanding resources um, per node. And what I had to do is I had to build up a signature for the type of job that was deployed given the image and the arguments, right? So, um, and even environment variables. So as long as the jobs were similar enough, um, we could keep track historically using etcd the amount of resources that that job used and we could then use that to project forward the resource resource allocation. Um, and then two, we, we calculate the average job latency, which is basically, you know, given the pods to be scheduled, um, what can we expect? Um, when can we expect the uh, latency of, of, of them to be finished? Okay, and then so at the very bottom we have the actual delay, right? The amount of delay we'll add to the scheduler um, to hold off on um, adding more containers to a host. And so it's actually quite simple. Um, and also it's a bit arbitrary, um, you know, just my knowledge of how I suspected this would work had me come up with this algorithm and it worked well in practice. Um, but it's not modeling an end behavior in and of itself. So basically I take the average job latency times the pressure index uh, squared. And if that's above 0 0.25, uh, 25, um, use that value. Right, and, it, and if the P index is above 0 0.25, use that value, and else just ignore it. Um, we're not even close to the threshold, so don't worry about adding delay because you're just gonna slow down the system for jobs which don't have this um, resource pressure um, that happens when you have you know a huge batch job. Okay. So when I deployed the system uh, with this new scheduler, it quickly allocated a bunch of nodes. And then uh, once those nodes were out allocated, it, it drifted off of them and maintained the level of, um, sorry, maintained the level of pods, right? It maintained the level of jobs going in a pretty consistent manner. And so we didn't have to worry about, um, 
allocating too many nodes onto the system. Um, and so, you know, the best results I got were when we actually looked at the throughput of the system. And for small jobs on the Kubernetes cluster, right, when I only had a replication of a thousand, um, you know, to complete all the jobs only took about two minutes. And even when you doubled it, it maintained about the same with and without the scheduler patch. Um, but as soon as you hit that peak threshold, where all of a sudden too many containers were being deployed on the system and there was too much context switching, um, the patch ended up working out really well where it was able to increase the throughput of the system in a much better way uh, than if you just tried scheduling everything at one time. Yeah. Um, and so basically, um, there isn't really an overhead, right? Because um, of what I'm doing here with the P index is low enough, there really isn't an overhead in latency if there isn't a high resource pressure with like a large batch job coming in. So you don't really need to worry about that. So the, you know, the, the, you know, the downside to having this patch um, is, is really not too bad. Um, and then on the plus side, you know, on aggressive batch jobs, it's able to significantly increase uh, the throughput of the system. Um, whereas if you just tried scheduling everything at once, uh, it wouldn't be able to do that. All right. Um, so, you know, where where would be the future of of this algorithm? Um, right now, the model it uses, um, you know you know, it doesn't try to do any sort of learning itself. It just kind of assumes, hey, we have resources. You told me these resources are important. Um, we could use a feedback mechanism, um, although it'd be much more complicated to say, hey, you know, I'm going to try a bunch of different uh, perturbations to the scheduling algorithm. And once I find one that works, I'll hold on to it. Um, you know, I, I suspect that people aren't going to like that too much because people kind of like guarantees and something like that wouldn't provide you with a guarantee of when your job would get scheduled. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, the, the algorithm itself could be smarter. Uh, right now we average the job latency, but if we really wanted to, the scheduler, you know, at the cost of some more CPU um, and some more memory could model you know, the current state of the system, and given the current state of the system, you know, what's the expected number of jobs to finish by the time, um, you know, or just what's the expected number of jobs, to, uh, what, what's the expected amount of time for a job to finish? And then I could use that to schedule the current job. Um, given that everything's above the C uh, CPU utilization or given above the resource utilization. And right now we don't really do that. We kind of use a model that I kind of just came up with because I thought it would work well in practice. Um, that's everything. All right, thanks. Bye.